I want to walk through a simple example of how to apply the finite element method in this one dimensional situation. I, instead of using a computer, I'm actually going to do this by hand to just show you exactly what's going on under the hood. So in a real, of course, in a, in a real commercial code, you would probably not have access to how it constructs the matrices and things. But this will just give you an idea of exactly how this works and how good it actually works. Um, so let's do a simple example. So this is an example where uh, we are going to solve for internal heat generation in a one-dimensional slab where the temperature on the two sides of the slab are specified. Let's call that temperature um, T sub S, the surface temperature. And to make the problem particularly simple, I'll, I'll, I'll make it symmetric so that like X, the, the, the two sides of the surface are at X equal minus L and X equal plus L. Um, we'll just use a internal heat generation value of one and a constant value of the thermal conductivity. Um, the exact uh, solution to this problem is usually done in like your first undergraduate heat transfer class, and it turns out to be a parabola. You can you can calculate the exact solution to this problem. You don't need a finite element solver. Um, so what I want to do is solve that problem using the finite element method. But uh, I'm going to do it with a very small number of nodes so that I can actually do this by hand in like a reasonable time frame. So um, what I'm looking for is this exact solution. So this is the red line, which is supposed to be a parabola that has value T sub S on the two boundaries um, between, I don't know, uh, x equals minus L and x equals plus L. That means that since I've got three nodes, that means there's four intervals. That means that each interval has length um, or like the each interval distance if they're evenly spaced is L over two since it goes from minus L to plus L. Um, so just as a reminder, we're going to use these test these uh, functions, these uh, weighting functions to build up our finite element method. So uh, our our polynomials for constructing the temperature profile will be these tent functions and the polynomials that we'll use for our test functions like we're going to have to test whether our weak form is satisfied three times to get our three unknowns um, so we'll use this red blue and green um, set of polynomials I believe it turns out in this problem that there is no need to invoke um, the temperatures at the two sides um, Okay, so uh, here is our weak form. Um, we have already said that we're going to specify the temperature, which means we only need the three um, testing functions, W sub X. None of those three testing functions are non-zero on the boundary, and that means that the very first term here goes away. There is, no, there is nothing to set up associated with the boundaries here. Um, so in that case, everything that I had said about like how to go from the weak form to the matrices is exactly correct. So if I look at what needs to be evaluated here um, in order to solve this problem, what I really need to do is um, just, I need to evaluate this term to find the values of the matrix coefficients. And I need to evaluate this term over here to evaluate the value of the, um, let's call it the right hand side of the matrix. Okay, so we just need to do some integrals here. And what this really comes down to is like figuring out like what the integral of two piecewise polynomials is. This is pretty straightforward stuff. Um, it does help like for the sake of looking at this problem. So since what I need here is some integrals of the derivatives of those piecewise polynomials, I've actually written out. So if these were the original polynomials, let's say this is our red polynomial P sub one then the derivative of that piecewise polynomial. So the derivative is upward in this case. That's so a positive slope with a constant value from minus L to let's say L minus two. And then um, it has a negative slope when I go from that node to the next node. So that's this. So it's got a positive value from over one portion of the integral and then all of a sudden it switches signs and then it's got a negative value over the other portion. And then since this the rest of this red line is actually meant to be flat. It has no value. The, the slope is zero everywhere else. So basically it's like a little, it's a positive step, a negative step, and then zero for, let's say, P sub, the derivative of P sub 1. Um, let's see. 
And I guess the values, if you look at it because of the, the distance over which that happens, the value is, um, I guess, 2 over L to minus 2 over L is the value of the um, derivatives. So we can work those out, and that means that we can actually compute that because, let's see, so if K is a constant, it just comes outside this integral. Um, so we just need to be able to evaluate this integral. Now even though this integral goes from minus L to L, the only place where these any of these two functions overlap is um, in the case of like, for example, the P sub 1 only overlaps with the slope of P sub 2 um, in this region. There's only like a, a region of size, um, whatever that is, L over 2, where they actually overlap, unless m is equal to n, in which case they are the same function, and then they overlap for the whole length of it. So you kind of have to go through this logic. So like, if the two overlap, so if I'm talking about how p1 overlaps with p1, then you basically just take the square of the value, multiply by the length over of the integration region, and you can work that out to see that like the coefficient associated with n equals 1, m equals 1, um, it turns out to be 4 over L. Um, if, and, that, and that turns out to be true for any of the ones where M is equal to N because basically all these 10 functions look the same. Um, so those are the diagonals of this matrix. Um, what about the off diagonal? So this is the case when n is equal to 1 and m is equal to 2. So in that case, this only partially overlaps with this function, um, only in this region here. And they have opposite signs. So like if you check out that value, it's uh, minus 2 over L squared times the distance over which they overlap, which is L over 2. So that's what this is. Um, so if you work out, by the way, I think there's a sign issue here. It's, it's, uh, this minus sign goes on the outside of this, not on the inside. Um, so in that case, I'm sorry about that sign error. Um, it should be minus 2 over L. And that turns out to be true for all of the off diagonals, except the ones that are separated by quite a bit. So like, for example, this red one has no overlap with this green one. So 1 and 3 don't overlap at all. And similarly, 3 and 1 don't overlap at all. And so when I do that integration, I get 0. And actually, if you had like a much larger system with a lot of 10 functions, most of the 10 functions would have no overlap. And most of the values turn out to be 0. So for that reason, the finite element method usually leads to sparse matrices. OK. Um, so that actually works out all of the possible coefficients of the A matrix. You can go through and calculate all the possible values of the um, of this uh, thing B sub M. If I look at this, so uh, let's see, the portion over here, let's see, well there's one portion, so this portion, this integral can be done separately here. So the integration over the internal heating over P sub M um, that turns out, since the internal heating is the same everywhere, um, basically it's, that just turns out to be the area under, under a tent function. So the area under a tent function turns out to be um, L divided by 2. Um, and so uh, if you include the minus sign that's supposed to come with it, that's minus Q triple prime L over 2. Uh, the other integral that has to be done here, so for example the one that involves TA, um, involves, uh, let's see, what does it involve? So it, over, it, it requires you to calculate the overlap between essentially uh, the PA 10 function and the PM 10 function. Uh, actually, only the very first one, so like if M is equal to 1, there is some overlap between, let's say, this red one and this 10 function, but there's no overlap for any of the other ones. Um, and so you can just calculate it for the very first one. Um, so that value turns out to be whatever this thing is. And then I believe there's one associated with the very last function as well. So there's some overlap between this green function and this very last um, this very last test function. I don't know why I wrote V here. I think this should be a B. Um, 
So that turns out to be exactly the same value just with a TB instead. So uh, those can be calculated. So if I put all of that stuff together, um, so we've now calculated all of the values of the matrix. So for the diagonals, the off diagonals, and the off off diagonals, um, as well as all of the values for the different Bs that could happen. Um, if you actually, um, so like that basically just defines a, a system of algebraic equations, three equations and three unknowns. And if you solve them, you'll get an answer. It turns out that the temperature at the first node is three eighths of whatever it is, Q triple prime L over K plus whatever the surface temperature was. Um, and then at the midpoint, it's like half rather than three eighths and so on and so forth. How does that stack up with the exact solution? Good question, glad you asked. It turns out it's exactly equal. Um, so um, the finite element method is it is able to get the exact solution to the temperature at those nodes. Um, this is actually a very common feature of the finite element method. So if you're using piecewise linear polynomials, it can get the exact solution as long as your solution is parabolic. Um, if you have something of high, if, if the exact solution is higher than parabolic order, you can't represent that with a piecewise polynomial solution. But it's pretty interesting that with a piecewise linear solution, you can get the exact solution at the nodes for a polynomial, um, uh, for a quadratic polynomial. Um, so that's a common feature of finite element methods. They can represent, um, like if, the, if, if you're using a polynomial to, to do the interpolation that's of order, um, I don't know, let's, let's say two, then that means that you can actually represent, you can get the exact node um, values for real, for real solutions that might have polynomial like order up to four. Like basically you get it um, with a power that's twice as high. So um, the finite element method is really good in that way. Now it doesn't get the correct answer anywhere in between the nodes because it has to do an interpolation in between that it might have the correct value at the nodes but it won't get the correct interpolation in between. Um, but you know as long as you use a small set of nodes